Hello, and welcome to the Natural State Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anthony Gustin. It is my belief that the natural state of any living organism is health, and that our artificial habitat has forced us into having artificial health problems. This show is my attempt to dive deep and learn about using nutrition, sleep, movement, relationships, and more to help you reclaim your natural state of health in a modern world and show you how to thrive in an environment that's stacked against you. If you enjoyed today's show, you can find out more details and information at dranthonygustin.com. Today on the podcast, we have one of my favorite recent guests, and his name is Robbie Sansom. Robbie is the co-founder and CEO of one of my favorite new companies called Force of Nature. Uh, I love what this company stands for and what they're doing. So what they do is they sell all regenerative agriculture-based meat products. And if you are not sure what that term means, then this podcast is exactly what I want to do is educate you on this topic. I think it's one of the most important things that we could be thinking about right now from sourcing food. I think it's going to be the next sort of organic huge wave moving forward. And what regenerative agriculture is just a, is a short little snippet before we dive in is basically taking animals, plants, etc., and restoring normal ecosystems so we can get the soil back to proper health, restore ecosystems. And this has a lot of huge ramifications, not only for your health, but for the environment as well. This is the only system that's been able to show bringing carbon from the atmosphere back into the soil. So, I mean, I've seen this huge sort of vegan propaganda shift from saying vegan is a healthier diet, you know, maybe eight, 10 years ago when I started really being into nutrition to now it's a little bit more focused on vegans more sustainable. And when you're looking at it from a commercially farmed animal operation, that's true. It's it's just frankly true. Um, However, when you switch to a regenerative based model, it's actually the opposite. So vegan diets still cause a lot of carbon emissions into the atmosphere, but the regenerative model brings carbon back into the soil and starts reversing things like climate change. You know, not only that, but there's a lot of downstream effects environmentally that are impacted with regenerative than, you know, just saying vegan or commercially raised meat. So this is something that I'm, I'm super interested in. This is pretty much all I'm researching in my free time right now is everything regarding regenerative agriculture and sort of restoring ecosystems while also addressing the food system. So super interesting episode for me personally um, and tune in and I hope you learn some stuff and get interested in this movement and vote with your dollars and support what Robbie and people like this are doing. All right, let's get into the show. Before we get into today's episode, I wanted to tell you about how you can directly support the show. It is not free to produce this podcast, and I don't want to use the typical model of selling your attention to sponsors to fund the show. I want you to be able to take all of my health recommendations seriously without wondering if I'm being paid to promote something to you. If you want to support the team that is behind this podcast, head on over to either one of the brands that I've founded at perfectketo.com or equipfoods.com. I've developed the products for each of these companies with my insanely high standards because I couldn't find them anywhere else. Perfect Keto offers everything you need to support a whole foods-based ketogenic diet from exogenous ketones to help you transition into keto and boost your energy to super clean collagen bars that have been tested not to spike your blood sugar. It's literally the only bar that I know of that won't and that's why I made it. Over at Equip Foods, we take real food ingredients seriously. You'll find only whole food ingredients like beef protein powder, sweet potato powder, grass-fed liver capsules, and more. If it's your first time trying the products at either one of these brands, use code NATURALSTATE for 20% off your first order. And if you feel amazing focusing on 100% real foods, awesome. These products are intended to support a proper foundation of health and nutrition, and they're not magic pills. All right, enough of that. Let's get into the show. Robbie, thanks for coming on the show, my man. Thanks for having me, bud. Uh, so I wanted to have an expert on the the podcast for a while, all things regarding food system in general, but more specifically focused on animal production and regenerative agriculture and everything involved with that. Um, if anybody has read any of my stuff, newsletter, listened to the podcast, social media, they will know how much I hate fake food, fake meat especially. And we haven't had a, sort of an expert to dive in and explain a lot of these concepts. And I think that you're one of the people I think of first when I think of sort of people at the front of this movement and pushing things forward. So thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, I'm super happy to be here and, and talking about this stuff. It's it's weird to be called an expert because you know the people that I think of as as experts can can run circles around me, and then there's people that can run circles around those people. But we have spent the better part of the last decade immersing ourselves and and traveling to ranches and and reading books and studying, and then of course you know more recently. 
doing building our own ranch and learning hands on some of this stuff. So it's it's really exciting to talk about. Yeah. So I mean, and that yes, there's probably people who know a little bit more about soil health, et cetera, things like that, but you're one of the only people who's actually doing anything about it at scale. And this is something that I find to be the most important thing. And this is why I focus on building businesses and offering the products that I have is because I want to make change at a larger scale. And I think the way you do that is with markets and having people actually use purchasing power. And you, I mean, maybe the best way to start is just talking a little bit about your background and sort of what you're focused on right now. So people have an understanding of sort of like your way and your participation in the regenerative agriculture movement. Yeah. So, you know, talking about myself as well as um, my, my co-founders and, and Katie and Taylor, um, I won't go all the way back on all of our backgrounds, but, you know, the, the Katie and Taylor founded a company called Epic Provisions. Um, I joined very early on and helped them grow and scale that. And, you know, that is where we essentially became introduced to these really important concepts in food. You know, the idea there was shelf stable, conveniently packaged products, wanted to be really healthy alternative to the heavily, heavily grain based, heavily sugar based products that were in the market. Um, did so by incorporating healthy animal proteins into the product. And then that starts the journey. What's a healthy animal protein? Well, it comes from healthy animals, which come from healthy lands, which come from healthy soils. And as you peel the layers back on the onion, you start to realize just how challenged our existing agriculture system is. Um, and so, you know, we were really fortunate enough to build that brand around a set of values that truly aligned with and rallied a, a massive group of consumers. And we were able to, through that influence, um, actually sell that brand to a large food organization and then legitimately change the way that that larger food organization, in this case, General Mills, ran their business to the point where they've most recently announced that they're going to transition 1 million acres of their supply chain to regenerative agriculture. And that includes all of the supply chain for brands like Cheerios and Nature Valley, as well as some others. And so it's been a, a really incredible journey for us where we've learned a ton about these issues and these spaces. And to your point, there's just not anybody doing this in meat and an animal protein. And which is, which is remarkable because these are living sentient beings that we need to be incredibly thoughtful of how they're being raised, the life that they experience, um, the land that they're on and how those lands evolved to have animals incorporated onto them, as well as the impacts then on a broader group of stakeholders, whether it be broader lands or, or, or the globe or um, the health of and wellness of the people consuming those products. Right. And then so maybe touch a little bit about what you guys are focusing on right now, specifically. So the, we, we recently co-founded and launched a company by the name of Force of Nature. Um, you can find us at forceofnaturemeats.com. And we've taken those same issues and concepts and, and realized that you know, meat makes up the majority of the, of the plate for most consumers um, at most mealtimes. And it's a massive industry with 99% household penetration. You know, everybody is crossing paths with meat at some point or another. Um, however, we also know that meat is incredibly challenged. And quite frankly, that meat is under attack, right? Because we have these large incumbent meat producers that have been somewhat misleading and deceitful, sometimes intentionally or unintentionally or conveniently, um, but they've been cutting corners and, 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 and taking liberties with how they produce that food product while consumers have had blinders on. Um, and have taken us down a path that likely the vast majority of consumers would not agree with or support. But we're being forced to by virtue of a lack of transparency or a, a lack of awareness. Simultaneously, as those issues are becoming more amplified in the, in the conversation of the public discourse, it's being you know, sort of hijacked by what I would consider to be these false profits, these fake, highly processed, manufactured meat alternative companies coming on and saying, oh, hey, you know, we're not conventional meat, therefore, by virtue of being different, we must be better. And the truth is, they're not better. They're less healthy for consumers. They're just as devastating for the environment and the lands. There's a myriad of issues that they're major contributors to and not solutions for, but they're being heralded as a solution, again, but just by virtue of being different. And so we're trying to come in at a time when the conversation has never been louder and, never, and it never been more important to say, hey, whoa, wait a minute. The way that we've been doing things and the way we've de devolved our our practices over the last over the last few decades isn't appropriate and we can be better but the answer isn't to remove animals from the conversation altogether yeah and the so, answer is better meat yeah and this is sort of the the thing that i think people don't have full context on they think that if you're eating meat it has to be in a commercially raised animal feeding operation and and 
and I think that there's a lot of things of concern of that, that anybody who has a soul was, you know, should be concerned about. Um, so there's sort of this big problem of how meat is done now, how animal products are done now. And then there's, I would say like the, a extreme response to it in the fake mood, m fake meat movement. Um, what's wrong with how food is produ produced commercially now from animal product standpoint? So we've, the, the, the challenge is the, 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 there's devastating impacts on a ton of different um, stakeholders. So, you know, first you have the animals themselves um, and the way that they're treated. Um, you know, these are animals that a lot of people would consider to be pets. And you look at the environments that they're being put into um, necessarily in order to mass produce at the lowest possible costs. Um, you look at the antibiotics that they're giving, um, you know, subtherapeutically and prophylactically to help promote growth as well as to sustain life in environments that wouldn't, you know, that otherwise would not be compatible with life. Um, and then you look at what happens as byproducts of that in waterways and um, reservoirs. Um, you look at the implication of mass production of food and agriculture. So here, here's an example I like to share. 10% of the land mass of the United States is covered in nothing but monoculture row crop corn. Um, so think about the ecosystem impact of that much desertified landscape. I read something recently that said, the tall grass prairies in the United States, we only have about 15% of them left and the rest has been converted into these monoculture landscapes that are completely isolated in nature. These monocultures don't exist in nature. In order to create one, you have to kill off all other forms of life to promote the one form of life that you're trying to, you know, get a get, get a food profit from, and, and continue to kill off, and continue yeah. to at, at at lower and lower efficacy rates, and so that means spraying. That means spraying fertilizers um, to promote growth in an unhealthy soil system. That means spraying herbicides to kill off quote unquote weeds, spraying insecticides to kill off bugs, spraying fungicides to kill off fungus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Only 20, 30 percent of that sticks. 70% runs off and creates algae blooms and dead waterways, dead zones and oceans. All of that stuff kills off pollinators. You got atmospheric carbon loads. You got the FAO report uh, from the, United, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations saying, hey, at the rate we're doing all of this stuff on a global scale, we only have 60, 60 years of crop production left on our planet. Um, and that speaks to the fact that, like you said, it has to be done over and over and over again. And the rate, the, the success rate every time is a little bit less because nature's trying to evolve and nature's trying to adapt to these practices. And so, again, there's a myriad of issues that are compounded by the way we practice agriculture. And again, for perspective, agriculture is practiced on, you know, over 30% of our lands globally. Um, so the, you know, going back to that 10% of corn example, I mean, you are looking at massive, massive loads of chemicals and the use of p petroleum or fossil fuels to run equipment. The other thing that I haven't touched on is the communities that are producing our food, the, the, the farmers and the ranchers. And what this large industrialized centralized system has done is, you know, virtually made them into sharecroppers. And, 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 and the challenge with that has been, we've seen the decimation of rural America. We've seen rural communities decline, schools close, you know, the, the places where our food is made become food deserts. Um, and farmers actually have a higher rate of suicide than veterans returning from war because the hope from their system is being taken away and they're seeing their generational wealth and their lands, they're losing it because the viability of those operations, they're, getting, they're just getting squeezed and pushed out. Um, and they're watching their lands be degraded and desertified in the process and their children no longer feel desire to come back and run the family business because there's no hope or money in it and they're leaving. The average age of a farmer in the United States is over 60. Most farms aren't expected to make it past the next generation and um, something like a third or more of farms are expected to change, hand, change hands in the next decade. So there's a, it just, it's so complex, it's really difficult to talk about because so many major issues are intertwined. Um, but the way that we've lobbied consumers to say, hey, we have to accept these compromises in our values to support a food system to quote unquote feed a growing population is total bullshit. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things. So the way I bucket the perceived problems regarding animal production and food system as a whole are one, ethical, two, environmental, and three, health focused. And like you said, like these things aren't just directly involved with the food you eat. So for example, like the, the 
suicide rates, the runoff into rivers, like the health implications of this type of a food system are far outside of just what's on your plate. And what's bizarre, like so bizarre to me is that we now have people understanding this from, you know, maybe just the animal perspective, which again, there's like a lot of great and valid points here about how, like you said, they're the pump of the antibiotics, they're in these stressful environments, they have a terrible life. It's like, it's not how I would want my life to be if I were an animal, obviously. Um, so we say, okay, here's the alternative. Here's the, here's the replacement. We make this fake meat to satisfy this misinformation about health. So putting vegetable oils into, in like all this processed stuff into food, people think that that's healthier than eating beef because of saturated fat or whatever reasons they want to claim. Um, two, it's better ethically because you don't have to kill anything which I would argue against when you are talking about these monocrop systems and everything we just said. Um, and then three, it's more environmentally responsible. So I'd love to just touch on sort of your perspective regarding, you know, fake meat in general, impossible beyond all these things, that, as far as how they are not doing any of those three things, even though they just bludgeon the public perception with the fact that, you know, they are the virtuous brands out there trying to save food production for the rest of us. So, I mean, as far as health goes, I mean, we do a whole podcast episode on this, but why is beyond meat impossible, et cetera, not healthy when compared to meat? Yeah. I mean, they've done a really good job of getting credit for a lot, right? Um, much of which they, 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 like, like you and I would agree, don't, don't deserve credit for on, on the, on the health side, you said we could create a whole podcast on that. And you're right. I mean, there's, I think there's a ton of content out there already about the health of, you know, those alternative products without getting into the fact that there's, you know, some 20, 30 plus ingredients, most of which I can't even pronounce. You need the PhD to understand what they are. Um, you know, it's, it's bizarre to me that we've lost, you know, we, we started the healthy food movement with the whole foods movement and understanding what you eat. And now the, the same group that may have been an advocate for those, um, those values is now launching some of the most highly processed meat that we've, or highly processed food we've ever produced as a species and, 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 and conveniently <laughs> launching them into fast food chains, which I think is entirely appropriate and rather comical. Um, but yeah, they're, they're not healthier, right? I mean, they're, they're basically taking the premise that meat is unhealthy. Therefore, any alternative to meat must be better, which I mean, can we just call that myth debunked? Yeah. Um, I mean, one would hope so. But you have you know documentaries like Game Changers coming out and you know, people like truly believing. I think that most people truly believe that if it's plant-based, no matter how processed, it's better than animal-based. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you, you want to touch on all, all three of your, your tiers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think that, that's good enough for health. But okay. as far as the ethical impact... You know, we have the ethical impact of, you know, obviously, yes, you have to kill an animal, eat it, of course. Um, what I don't understand is that people don't seem to not put any value on, you know, rodents, insects, snakes, plants themselves because they're just less like them. Like I, there seems to be this disconnect of maybe people understanding what goes into food production and monocropping these things. And so, for instance, if we're putting soy, pea, et cetera, and these come from monocrops. Like what is happening in these monocrop systems from an ethical standpoint? You know, I don't know if you have any stats or things about crop kills, things like that, or how the soil diversity and ecosystem just get absolutely destroyed and decimated just so one thing can grow. Um, I mean, your take on the ethical impacts of eating like a monocrop based impossible or beyond. Yeah, and I've even heard recently some, some, some vegan psychologists talk about the issue and, and, and fortunately heard finally some, um, some honesty in that conversation where they recognize like, Hey, we're just not comfortable being directly associated with the death of, of an animal. But I also understand that indirectly all of our systems, I mean, heck just driving to and from work, you got, you, you got sentient life all over the, the grill of your vehicle. Exactly. exactly. And this you is the point I mean? that I bring up all the time. Um, and, and just because that a fly or a mosquito looks less like you than a cow, that life is less important. Like, wh right. like where and, does that, where does that end? Well, and, and, and the, so, so to your point, right, you know, in, an, in, an, in a normal conventional cropping system, you're going to take a um, native ecosystem that's thriving, full of soil life, full of, you know, land and, and, and bird life. And, um, you're going to clear that out to make it into a monoculture, which means, um, you're, you're destroying habitat and you're, and you're 
probably killing a lot of life in that process. And then ongoing, once it's already established, you're going to run a, um, a tractor and till up that soil. Um, and tilling up the soil is going to kill a lot of soil life. Um, it's also going to kill a lot of small mammals, small amphibian, reptile, insects. Um, you know, anybody that's ever seen mass agriculture practice, you see the vultures following those um, machines for a reason. Um, it is devastating on, 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 a, on a sentient life um, basis. And then, of course, once you've gone, gone through those steps, now you're planting, which is running more equipment, and then you're um, spraying, um, and you're legitimately spraying insecticides and things that will kill off, you know, indiscriminately, generally speaking, um, insects as well. So um, le leading to a lot of the challenges that we're facing now with, poll with pollinators. Um, so, I mean, the list just goes on, right? When you, when, you, when you talk about the ethics of food and the ethics of um, that it takes life to sustain life, I just, I don't know how to, where to begin or end that conversation because it's so unnatural that on this planet, where we have this beautiful circle of life that we celebrate in all contexts, except where we interact with it. It's life, death, decay, and new life. And we think that's so romantic, um, again, that we celebrate it. But if the human interaction or the human involvement in that process um, is ever discussed, we feel as if we have some outsider's role in this natural ecosystem. And if only there was some way where we could remove ourselves from the fact that there's an end of life experience that takes place in all aspects of growth and nourishment. Um, and, there, and there's really not. But what I think there is, and the one thing that sets us apart from you know, other omnivore or carnivore species, right, is you see killer whales and lions and um, wolves and other animals killing for play or for sport. It happens all the time. Um, I think they're just genetically programmed to do that, right? The one thing that we have that a lot of species don't have is this capacity for empathy. And so I think where we do have a duty or a responsibility in um, our food system, as well as being you know, stewards of our planet, um, we have this ability to destroy our planet or to manage and, and save it, um, at least our role on it. Um, we have this opportunity to employ empathy in how we raise that food and, 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 and how thoughtful we are about the impact on sentient life. And you know, in, in, in our case, um, in the case of force of nature and regenerative agriculture, we recognize that animals were put here for a really important purpose. And for the tens of thousands of years since the last ice age and the hundreds of thousands of years that, that humans have been co-evolving with these species on the planet, um, you know, we have an opportunity to figure out in our agriculture systems, how do we se celebrate those symbiotic relationships and those natural processes that have evolved to coexist together and employ that in, in how we practice and manage our lands. Um, and to do so in a way that allows animals to fulfill their potential in those ecosystems and to live their life to the fullest and to exhibit their, the behaviors they evolved to exhibit and play the roles they evolved to, pr to play. And then recognize also that those animals, part of that important role is to be food for other animals. Um, and that in that end of life experience, we can celebrate that animal and be empathetic towards that animal. And then how we speak about and talk about the byproduct of that animal as it feeds and nourishes our friends and families to celebrate it as well by not wasting it and using more parts of it and being more thoughtful as we are uh, consuming it. Well said. I mean, I think we could extend that into a whole podcast episode as well. But I mean, one of the things that for me as well, going hunting for the first time recently, I mean, it's just very, very clear to me that humans are the same as any other animal. Like there are certain things in me that were just sparked from like a primal standpoint of like looking at a horizon and seeing trees move but looking for animal movement and sort of the adrenaline is like, there, there's something in us that knows that we should be in the system of everything's just trying to basically eat or not be eaten, right? That, that, that's, that's what it is. It's like the circle of life, like you said, like everything should interact. And I think that people sort of, re, since we've mo removed ourselves from a natural environment and now we're sitting in office building, you know, recording a podcast that's going to be published on the internet, we, and we, we sort of have this illusion that we have control over the fact that we're going to die, which again is just, in my opinion, an illusion. Like who knows, who knows that you're going to die and you know what, you're going to die and the worms are going to eat you and on the cycle goes. And that's like, we are also a part of that food system, that food cycle, that circle of life. And I think that when people don't participate in that and actually, you know, uh, again, like when participating in the end of life process and celebrating that and like recognizing it and respecting it, you, you have just a different experience altogether of this 
you, you know, your role in this circle of life. Uh, and uh, you know, another thing, so just to touch on the, the environmental standpoint, I mean, you have so many people who want to do the right thing, you know, global warming, climate change, et cetera. One of the hot button issues of our day, you know, very divisive. And you have people running around who are seemingly doing the right thing. Like little Greta, who says that the best thing you can do as a human to contribute to this reduction in climate change is stop eating meat and eat these other products instead, impossible burger, beyond meat, et cetera. I mean, how do we even start picking this apart for people? It just seems like even though we have some information regarding this, like wh wh where's the best place for you to start? Like, how do you think about this environmental impact of processed plant food versus animal products? I think, I think the first thing we need to look at is agriculture as a whole, whether it be plant-based or animal-based. Um, we've got to recognize that our, our natural ecosystems that, um, where we all evolved and everything that we're growing and eating evolved, um, were diverse and plants and animals interacted. Um, and so what is regenerative agriculture? Um, cause I think regen the concept of regenerative agriculture is what differentiates what we're going to be promoting and talking mm. about today versus what these monoculture based systems that uh, you beyond and impossible and right. the incumbent systems are relying on. I, I would say even beyond that, I don't know if you've done any digging as far as like the, the conventional way that the animal products are being produced right now mm -hmm. versus let's say a monocrop, assuming that that's what's going to be happening in not a farmer's market based agriculture system, but conventional animal production versus conventional plant production. Would skipping out on a conventional, you know, piece of meat or steak or whatever like that be better for the environment than, you know, um, indulging on that? I think the the existing life cycle assessments done on the the worst case scenario, the most conventional system of of beef, um, show that it's pretty significant in terms of how much more challenging it is from a carbon equivalent standpoint than um, poultry or um, soybeans or corn or some of those things. Um, it's 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 pretty the the the, the delta is pretty large um, with conventional beef. And that is why they take, they take that worst, um, you know, our, our counterparts would take that worst case scenario and apply it indiscriminately to an entire industry, which I don't think is a fair representation. Um, and they're also only focused on that carbon issue, right? And I, I think that is extremely naive and, and myopic because there's so many more um, issues to consider. So I would say on the carbon issue, there's an argument that beef is more challenging um, than conventional row crop agriculture, but on basically the rest of the spectrum, whether it be consumer health, whether it be um, chemicals in our food, chemicals in our waterways and, and dead zones in our oceans and challenges to pollinators and soil erosion and runoff and health and wellness of consumers and all of this, these other important issues that are globally relevant and significant at this time, plant-based agriculture is no better. Our agriculture system as a whole is what is what is what's challenged. Right. And so the alternative, like you said, regenerative agriculture. So this is something that is now sort of becoming a trendy topic. I think personally that we need to coin a new term for it. Too many syllables. It's not catchy. You know what I mean? Um, like paleo, keto. Like you know, it's easy to have like an updated name. Like we need to come up with some some new branding here. Um, it's because re like saying regenerative agriculture is just sort of a mouth mouthful, and people. It's not like a cool term to say. So I don't know if you have any ideas on that, but uh, what is regenerative agriculture? So the, the, there's some really great outfits out there that have, um, that have a definition that, um, that many, many brands are uh, aligning around um, for the sake of making it you know, tangible and palatable for folks listening. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share what we would consider to be the five principles of regenerative agriculture. And I think that also helps highlight tangible examples of what the difference between regenerative and conventional would be. Um, but for starting off though, the whole idea of regenerative is we have a degenerative farming system right now. And we have over time um, degraded our landscapes and the quality of our landscapes where our food comes from. Um, and that process is continuing at, um, at whatever rate, it's continuing to degrade to the point where at some point we will fully have desertified our food systems and that's that point at which we cannot recover um, and we cannot rebound and and um, 
get back on a more a path that can be sustained in any way, shape, or form. So regenerative is how do we regenerate those lands and, and rebuild and revitalize um, and get back to the potential um, that they have and truly that we inherited before we mined it to near full loss. Um, and the answer and, and, and the principles that regenerative agriculture promotes are let's stop battling nature. Let's stop engaging literally in chemical and mechanical warfare with nature and recognize that that long term is not a battle we will ever win. Um, and that there are important lessons, in fact, that we can learn that will actually empower us to have a better food system if we stop trying to fight a force that we have no chance of beating. Um, and so there's, there's five key principles we like to highlight, and we like to work with all of, our, um, all of our ranches and supply partners on ensuring that we're focused on promoting and expanding these in, in, in each and every operation, regardless of whether it be somebody producing a pork or, uh, or excuse me, a pig or a cow or a bison or anything in between. And so the, the first um, concept in regenerative agriculture is limiting chemical and mechanical disturbance. Um, without going into full detail, mechanical disturbance like tilling is truly devastating towards um, soil ecosystems, the, the rhizosphere of the ground. Um, what you see coming out of the ground is gonna be a reflection of what, what is beneath the ground. Um, and that is what we've been mining and, and degrading over time. Um, for a variety of reasons. Um, chemical disturbance being spraying, same, same impact, right? I would argue that perhaps tilling is more devastating to the soil environment than, than even spraying. And spraying is very damaging, but it's also damaging to everything else it runs off right. and touches and people who eat it. Yeah, and I think that like, the, the tilling thing is a, is a good point that I don't think a lot of people realize. Uh, and I mean, if you want to participate in this right now, you're going to a farmer's market, you can ask even where you, they, you get vegetables, like do they do, they do no-till farming? Um, it's something that, I mean, there's a place, Boggy, I know Boggy Creek does it. Um, but yeah, I mean, why is that so bad? Is it just because it's chewing everything up that should be there in the first place? Is it like, like, why do we do tilling in the first place? Is it due to the unnatural things that we're planting there and removing the animals from the, from the ecosystem? It's partly it's part of it. Yeah. Part of it is, you know, we need to we need to soften up this ground so that we can put in a you know desirable row of what we're trying to, mm -hmm. to grow our crop, you know, that we need to see a certain yield on. We're going to till certain times of the year just to kill, quote unquote, weeds. Um, we're going to till for a lot of reasons, and that's going to break up these massive networks of mycorrhizal fungi, which are sort of like the infrastructure beneath the ground. Um, which connect everything under the ground to the living roots of plants um, from above the ground. Um, it's sort of like a delivery system for, for minerals and nutrients. Um, again, we could have two hours of podcast on, on, why, on just why tilling is, is, is bad and adverse, but the, 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 the list of issues goes on and on. Essentially, tilling stops the soil from being able to do what it does, and that is to optimize a relationship between what's below the ground and above the ground and to do so in a way where everything can truly thrive and a thriving system producing our food is what's gonna create the healthiest, most nourishing, um, best tasting food for us. So the, that's the first principle, limit chemical and mechanical disturbance. The separate, second principle, as you'll see, ties to our conventional agriculture system is keep the soil armored. So armor comes in the form of you know organic matter plant litter um, or living plant um, leaves um, foliage, vegetation, et cetera, right? Essentially what you're trying to do is have a layer protecting the bare soil. Bare soil in direct sunlight can get over 140 degrees. That's above, if you think about your food, the cooking point to kill microbiological life in your food. Um, obviously, like we've been talking about, the, the biome, the microbiological life in the soil is just as important as it is to us and every other system. Um, litter covering the ground or a, a good thatch of living plants and, and, and diversity covering the ground also retains moisture and water, which is critical for growing plants. And it even protects the soil from erosion and soil loss. It takes a very long time, 500 plus years to create one inch of topsoil. We don't wanna be losing that to wind and water just because it's exposed. It protects the surface of the soil from the terminal velocity of a raindrop, simply just hitting it at, at a high velocity and capping it and making a layer of crust that prevents um, effective rainfall, or in other words, rain permeating into the ground and actually getting stored there or being usable by the plants. Um, and that capping also prevents seeds from getting into the ground or seeds from coming up out of the ground. So there's a ton of things that um, 
that happen if we expose our, our soil that are, that are adverse to our ecosystems and ad adverse to our farming systems. So we wanna keep the ground armored. Um, we wanna keep living roots in the soil year round. So fallow fields or um, periods of time between crops where we just have, a, again, a bunch of bare soil um, with no living roots, we have completely disrupted the, 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 the cycle that takes the most powerful force in our entire solar system, the sun, and converts that to energy. We all, all of us terrestrial, you know, above land beings get to benefit from it just by virtue of the fact that we're standing on top of the ground, but beneath the ground, the transportation system that delivers that massively powerful force is the roots of plants. Um, and the process by which that's done is called photosynthesis. And without getting into an evolved, it, very deep scientific conversation, carbon dioxide is in our atmosphere. The green growing plants with their all different shapes and sizes and colors of leaves take that carbon dioxide and, and with the power of the sun, convert it to carbon that they store in the ground and then oxygen they spit back out for us to breathe. And that's how you sequester carbon into the ground. But that carbon actually becomes fuel um, and an energy source for that below ground, that rhizosphere. Um, and again, that's sort of one of the key factors, that energy flow is one of those key factors in um, creating a healthy below ground system and, um, and making sure that you have an improving or again, regenerating, uh, regenerating um, system. The other thing is biodiversity, right? So, you know, we always talk about human health, eat a diverse um, diet. Um, because a lot of different foods are gonna do a lot of different things for you, where it's no different in nature, right? If you look around in nature, you always see diversity. Where nature's in control, it's promoting diversity. It's only where humans have disrupted the natural desire for that balance and harmony that we see these, these monoculture systems. And the reason for that is everything has a role and there's a way that nature is gonna over time promote a balance. And so, you know, in a regenerative system, we're gonna say, don't spray nitrogen, plant nitrogen fixing plants you know, turnips, legumes, clovers, these are sorts of plants that literally take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and put it into the ground and do it in, in the way that the ecosystems evolved. Um, you know, same thing with, you know, we'll get into animal impact as well, but diversity, well, animal impact is the fifth um, component. Um, you know, for every undesirable species of insects, there's over a thousand of desirable um, species that would offset the effects of it, right? And so, um, you know, I, a diverse system where you have diversity of plants, diversity of insects, diversity of animals, all functioning in harmony is going to truly yield an optimized outcome for us to um, create and produce our food from. And then we can get into the actual concept of ruminant animals and the role that they play in that, 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 that carbon capture. Um, and, and, rumin, and the reason I say ruminant animals is because they're the most heavily consumed ones typically. Um, and it's the easiest example to understand how we've disrupted the natural systems of these large herds of animals, these megafauna roaming across continents. Yeah, I mean, what is the history on this stuff? I mean, even with bison alone in the early 1800s, wasn't there like tens of millions of them? And then they were all hunted to like a couple hundred? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an incredible story and, 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 it, and it goes back beyond our, our record books, right? And this is sort of sadly the history of humans um, as we go back to our Neanderthal ancestors and beyond as we've Managed to access new continents um, time and time again. One of the one of the one of the um, outcomes has been the loss of megafauna. Um, now, bison are the most one of the most recent and one of the most tangible for us. But yeah, I hear the number quoted differently often. But you know, somewhere between thirty and you know maybe over sixty million bison at one point roaming North America, all the way from Canada down to Mexico literally the largest herd of megafauna since the last ice age was bison in North America. And the role that those animals played in building fertility into our, our prairie system is, is one of, if not the most critical keystone species roles. So, you know, before we hunted them to near extinction and hunted all of their predators that, that also played an important role in helping them to fulfill their potential or hunted to near extinction, um, there would have been these herds of millions and millions of animals densely herded together because they're herd animals and because there would have been a healthy predator prey relationship kind of um, nudging them accordingly. And they would migrate across the landscape again, all the way south to Mexico, all the way north to Canada, unselectively grazing, um, you know, limiting, chipping, packing seeds, being, you know, a form of a hairy pollinator, so to speak. Um, 
urinating, defecating on that land, rich organic matter full of biological life, rolling in the prairies and creating what ends up to being watering holes that became you know, ecosystems where, you know, amphibians would live, followed by tons of birds who are, you know, playing a role, just this really elegant dance. Um, and then they'd move past that spot within a couple of days once they'd eaten it to, you know, where there's just not enough food or they've defecated it to where they just don't want to be there anymore or the predators have pushed them on um, and they continue migrating. And they won't come back to that same place for, you know, many months at a time usually. Um, and then that, that cycle repeated for, you know, millennia. Um, until we came in and removed the predator species, removed the, the bison, um, and then further fenced off all of our lands and created these you know, private properties and public properties and essentially made it impossible for that process to continue and proliferate. And then further, we went into those systems and then you know, took those tall grass prairies that evolved with those animals that may have had root systems going as deep as 15 feet deep and again, promoting that healthy biological diversity. And we tilled them up, killed those, you know, began the process of killing those soils and mining those soils and, and putting in sort of these monoculture ag agriculture systems. All right, so regenerative agriculture, would you be reversing all of that and trying to get back to such an, a normal environment? And you know, I have a philosophy on health in general which is just that the further you get away from your natural environment as a human, the more sick you'll become. And this is true to mental health, this is true to physical health. I mean, we see it all the time. It's like you eat really terrible food and you're not out doing the things you need to do, your, your health is gonna suffer. You don't get proper sleep, you get exposed to bad light, you don't have movement, et cetera, your health is gonna suffer. And I'm starting to apply this principle to the, everything else that's a living organism, even the, like the earth for example, right? And the more natural environment you have, the more just normal health you have. It's like the, the path to fixing anything from like if there's dysfunction or disease or lack of health is just restoring it to its natural perspective and, and, and natural state. Like you said that there's some of these things that seem almost to be to an irreversible stage. Like, I mean, the question when, when you were saying like the bison were roaming from Canada down to Mexico that you sort of answered already that I was going to ask like, well, how do we then make a system that mimics that being that when we have private land and animals aren't free to roam, like what, what is the next step? Like how does somebody, I mean, this sounds like a very complicated affair to take the, you know, a, a set of land, right? A couple, let's say someone has like an acre, a couple hundred acres, whatever, like, is there a minimum that a farmer must have? to make this a viable thing to do regenerative agriculture? Like, like, what is, like, what are the parameters that which we can tangibly switch this land and this ecosystem from, you know, agriculture as it is now conventional to back to like this regenerative model? Awesome. And, and I do want to come back to your point on the health of the food coming out of these regenerative systems. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important that we elaborate some on that. So, um, if we could, um, but for, as far as, as far as what does it take to make, um, to convert from, you know, the path that we're on and, and, and essentially reverse the ship. Um, it's not that complicated. Um, we're essentially replacing a heavily and a very intensively input based chemistry based system with a management based understanding of biology based system. Um, and unfortunately, we can't just simply, you know, quote unquote, rewild by saying, okay, let's just turn nature loose and, and, and let it run its course right. because we've disrupted at such scale domestically and globally, um, it actually will take human intervention. So regenerative is a new technology is the result of new understandings in science and biology, um, and is the representation of how do we as food producers in our agriculture system shift our practices and shift our management of our lands to then emulate in a micro scale, these macro systems and understandings that we would have. And the way that you do that land by land, you know, rancher by rancher, farmer by farmer, geography by geography, continent, et cetera, varies slightly. And so I think the cool thing about this is there's no one right way that everybody must follow in order to begin regenerating their land. It's really within your context, within the size of your operation, within the resources, whether they be financial or, or, or people or whatever, based on where you are starting. Um, if you're heavily degraded, truly desertified land, or you're starting you know, somewhere in the middle, all of those factors come into play. Um, but the main thing is those five principles that I just listed out, um, how do you begin to employ those? Mm. 
um, as you transition from this more vicious cycle that we've been on to the more virtuous regenerative cycle that we're promoting. And so again, without getting into too involved into how that might apply differently in all of the different circumstances, again, it, it just goes back to, you know, are you limiting tillage? Are you limiting and, and eliminating um, spraying? Are you keeping the ground covered year round? Are you keeping living plants and cover crops and roots on the ground and allowing the photosynthetic capacity of that ground to, to realize its potential? Is it diverse? Are you incorporating animals into those lands? Millions of different ways to do all of those things at yeah. different scales in different contexts. Yeah, so my, so my fiance's dad um, has a 80 acre farm in Minnesota that was just a monocrop field. I think that had corn or something planted on it when they got it 20 plus years ago. And he's recently in like five, six years ago, got into prairie restoration in the Midwest. Um, and one of the things that he does is they just do very large prairie burns. And he's very big into invasive spe species. And so like you said, like sometimes we need different interventions for different areas. Mm -hmm. And from what I saw in Minnesota in this form, like, I mean, one of the stories that I tell people often of like the, the incredible ecosystem that's there, like not only do we go out and see deer and wild turkeys and like all like crazy animals that like you go a mile down the road and you don't see any of the stuff, but we were walking down these two rows of trees and it looked like just normal trees. And then you, you would walk through and each leaf had about 300 butterflies on it. That would just like, you would walk through and there'd be thousands of butterflies flying at a time. And this is something that, he just did this by planting some things in, in, a, in a different area, basically. He, he burned some stuff down, plant, like took care of the invasive species and sort of just let things grow and be as they were. It wasn't that complicated. I've asked him about it. And the thing that I want to bring up here though, is like being at, you know, Rome Ranch here outside of Austin, it's like the approach is very, very different. And I'm not sure if that's just due to, you know, an agriculture fo focus versus a geographical focus in difference. Um, how easy is it? Like, let's just take the United States as an example. You mean you said 30% of the world's agriculture, 30% of the land masses is, is committed to agriculture. And, you know, I don't know how, what the, the data is in the U S but like even the U S like region by region, is it, is it like very different and like how hard would it be to turn land in, Texas versus Minnesota versus New York versus California. Like, are there are some areas that are more um, easily changed over from a conventional to a regenerative model? Absolutely, right? Because you have, you know, significantly more arid um, and drier regions that you know get approached differently, and you have areas that have been more heavily impacted by, you know, lifetimes of you know conventional agriculture. Um, it doesn't make it impossible, it just makes it different. Um, you know, I would say that they're um, near, nearly a third of the, of the ag land in the US is, is rangeland, you know, rocky, mountainous type stuff where you can't even grow plants. And that would be treated a little bit differently than what you would do with systems where you have, um, you know, again, conventional sort of row crop agri agriculture and how you're bringing that back in and, yeah. um, and doing it. I, I mean, I think we could maybe take an example of, um, some places um, and, and share what has been done. And, and maybe Rome Ranch would be a good example sure. um, of how of how in a somewhat arid, you know, mid south type um, here, we're in central Texas. Um, and so, you know, the first thing that 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 um, Katie and Taylor, Katie and Taylor, the, the founders and owners of Rome Ranch did was put pollinators on the land um, and then let the land rest because it had been sprayed and had been heavily, um, heavily and intensively um, farmed for row crops and, and, and had um, cattle on it as well. And so letting it rest to get, again, green growing plants um, back over and then quickly began to um, put bison on the land to you know, spread um, organic matter and bring in um, water in times where there's um, low water supply and move seeds and really even trigger that cycle that had been um, starved in the system, right? I mean, plants know when they're being grazed on and it's different. Mm -hmm. um, and what you do in a regenerative system or in, in these contexts, that's a little bit different than just letting something rest is you're bringing these factors in, in a planned and hol holistically planned, thoughtful and controlled way. So you can actually accelerate the natural processes by being thoughtful of the stimulating factors. So in the most heavily degraded areas of the ranch, 
Um, we have to bring in outside fertility. So we'll bring in bales of hay and stuff, spread them out to cover the ground. Again, getting animal impact across that. And maybe those animals may, not, may, may only stay in that field for a half of a day um, and may not come back for a really long time because they're so challenged right now. Mm -hmm. Other areas where we have, it's been less disturbed. Maybe the bison will be back on there every 45 days or every couple of months. Um, then they've also began to incorporate chickens and they have that, those animals following the herds of bison doing something similar to what, you know, naturally what birds may have done in the plane, in the plane system as they evolved, you know, scratching up the, 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 the dung, um, disrupting the parasitic life cycle, um, dropping tons and tons and tons of nitrogen, super, super nitrogen rich, um, poop, scratching, breaking that soil surface, doing again, playing critical roles. Um, but in, 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 a, in a somewhat synthetic way, but again, thoughtful of these fences are here, these keystone species are gone. How do we, in a micro system, rotate these animals? And this is a thousand acre property that we're talking about at, at Rome Ranch. And so, you know, expand that times every one of their paddocks where they have, you know, this thing broken up into dozens and dozens and dozens of paddocks where they have the bison essentially migrating across that land as if they were migrating and not coming back for months at a time, yeah. migrating across the plane system. Yeah. And one of the probably most important things to explain there is that it's not going to be very easy to introduce natural predators back in. So that one of the main things you said before is like the predators that would usually chase around a herd. We just like, we are the predator now, like that's us. And so we have to be responsible for, for doing that in a way that makes sense under these, you know, parcels of land, a thousand acres. And so yeah, I think it's sort of a really clever way to manufacture the, the normal migration of the animal. Absolutely. And, um, as far as, you know, so we have people who are super knowledgeable, you guys taking this stuff over and doing that. What about people who their livelihoods are sort of tied to conventional agriculture currently? Like you talked about before, like, you know, average of a farmer, currently farming in, in a particular way, government subsidies, how do we transition existing conventional farmers and like have incentivize them to switch over? Like, like what are the yield differences from conventional to regenerative? Will they still make them the same amount of money? How long does it take? How much does it cost? Like, is this even a viable thing? I mean, what are the main things and like where you guys think of there? Yeah. One of the, one of the sad realities is, um, with our farm, our, our regulatory practices and, 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 and subsidies for farmers, we spend about $14 billion a year um, subsidizing our farming, our agriculture systems, and maybe only a billion dollars a year doing research. And a lot of that research is funded by and geared towards justification of existing practices. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we're known for being the most progressive and trying to push the envelope and think outside the box. Um, so we're, we're, we're very committed um, with a lot of big money interests into our existing system. But, um, you know, I guess if we're going to take a negative and turn it into a positive, um, we have a lot of intelligent, hardworking um, farmers and ranchers out there that are getting pushed to the brink um, of, being, of being desperate and being faced with this reality of, um, I need to make a choice. I'm either going to lose my family's legacy, or if I continue down the path, I've been, I've been pushed and promoted down, or I'm going to try something different. And unfortunately that sometimes is a significant factor in getting a, a, a land steward to change their, their practices and their behaviors because the system itself, as it is, as it exists today is punitive towards trying to break out of it. Right. Um, so we have that factor. And then, and then we, we truly have good people. They, they see what's happening on their land. They see less, um, birds, less pollinators, less wildlife. They see friends and neighbors dying early deaths of these strange conditions that didn't exist before they were spraying so many chemicals. And they see their community declining and, 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 and stores shutting down and schools shutting down and all of those things. And, you know, they know that there's clearly something broken that needs to be addressed. And so they intrinsically have a desire to be better and, and think better. Um, um, as far as the outcomes for them, the why for them, besides the fact that the current path is truly legitimately unsustainable for them, um, the, the yields can be similar um, in, in some cases, in some cases maybe slightly less, but not material. Um, certainly not when you think about the fact that there's 40% food waste in the, in the U.S. And if we're going to talk about how we feed a growing population, we should be thoughtful of how we're how we're utilizing the food that we grow and not mm -hmm. trying to make continue to make compromises to justify a bad practice. 
Um, I think the other thing to look at too is, you know, we, we quote yield numbers usually across one or two or a small number of crops. When you're in a regenerative system, by virtue of being diverse, you have significantly more revenue streams. And those revenue streams help offset any challenges, whether they be crop related or seasonality related across your system. Um, and that's been um, shown time and again. And what you actually end up with net net is higher on farm margins, mm. um, ultimately. Um, now, the other big you know, elephant in the room on this is in terms of what is a limiting factor or why might, you know, what might be preventing more and more farms and ranchers from doing that is the consumer. And so the reality is nobody is going to produce any product or grow any crop that consumers don't want uh, or won't pay for. And right now, our massive conventional centralized industrialized system is geared to produce the outputs that consumers are paying for and purchasing at the most massive scale and level. And I think that is being done in a way that is misleading and um, confusing to consumers intentionally, because I feel that most consumers would not be supporting those systems. If they knew the impact on the land, they knew the impact on animals, they knew the impact on their very own health and wellness, they'd absolutely be supporting a different system. They just don't have that understanding right. and that awareness. And further, once we get them you know, woke, so to speak, about our agriculture realities, um, and willing to do something different, we, we also don't have distribution. Um, we don't have access for those consumers to easily go out and signal, hey, you know, I'm tired of this, this, this old system that, you know, is taking advantage of me and the things and, and compromising the things that I care about. I want to support a better way. Uh, we, we make it unnecessarily difficult on consumers to be able to do that. And that's exactly what, what we're trying to do with Force of Nature is solve those two huge challenges that are, you know, essentially represent the two big dominoes that we got to knock over, right? And so force of nature is trying to go out and do all of the hard work on working with ranchers, educating, selecting, um, navigating the complexities of our food system, you know, domestically, internationally, and trying to make sure that we build a brand that stands for a very clear purpose and mission um, built around a set of values that aligns with many or most consumers, or at least some of the things that they care about. Again, in terms of representing success as a shift in our agriculture system and the growth of um, a system that's more thoughtful to the health and wellness of consumers, the quality of life and health and wellness of animals and the impacts on our ecosystems. So Forza Nature is a content creation company. You know, we're putting out tons of information about these issues. And we know that a lot of it in different, different is, is relevant and exciting to different types of consumers in different ways and coming at it from different angles. And so we want to tackle that education piece and that transparency piece um, and become a single point of understanding where, OK, well, I want to be better. I want to support something that's different and stands for what I believe in. I just need to look for this brand and understand that this brand is going to support a ton of other producers and a ton of other brands and aggregating um, that product. And because we're a single brand, you know, to your point about, you know, building businesses and marketing right. before, um, we also want to kick over that second domino about distribution. We want to make it easy for consumers to access us and what we're doing. And we're going to be transparent about where we're getting our products from and different ranches and sourcing partners and so on. And, you know, I was asked this question the other day, what if somebody doesn't buy from you, they instead buy directly from the ranch that you are sourcing from? I said, that's fine. You know, we're okay with that. We want to make sure that these issues are, are brought to the forefront and these um, and consumers um, are able to send those demand signals and able to access what they think is best and what aligns with them. We just want to be the conduit. And if it's through our brand or through some other, we're fine with it. Right. And I mean, I, th I don't think we all understand the role of businesses. And like you said, voting with dollars. And the, like if you guys get a couple extra dollars of margin, you can then reinvest that to other ranches, to pushing out more content, to spreading this message, to figuring out distribution models. Like uh, people, I think just in this world, this divisive world of they have money, I don't have as much money. There's billionaires. We have Elizabeth Warren talking about how we, we need to redistribute all the wealth. People sort of think of business as this evil thing that a business owner just makes all of the money that you give them. And I think that when you have appropriate attentions in, in, in legitimate business owners, they are trying to fix problems. And the more money you give businesses that are doing things the right way, the more they can solve problems. And I think that especially with mission-driven companies like this, 
um, you know, we want to make getting off diabetes medications easy, right? You guys want to make figuring out how to transition more, more ecosystems to regenerative easier. Like, yes, you can go straight to a ranch and I don't think there's any problem with that at all. Feel free. But I think that when more people give businesses like yours money, like you can solve more problems. I think this is an important point that a lot of people don't understand. I get sort of, sort of like people think that I'm just trying to make tons of money off of people. Like I, I'm in debt personally to, to Perfect Keto, for example. Like this is a company that like I have not made money on and I'm doing it for a reason to like make some change. And I think that there's just uh, the landscape of companies who have sort of done, done things the wrong way, but there are companies who do things the right way. Just like there's agriculture done the, right, the wrong way and there's agriculture done the right way. Um, going back to what you were saying before about feeding the world's population, yield, et cetera. I mean, 40% you said was lost in just waste. Is a model like this, like, can we, like, is the input enough, like too much to overcome? Meaning the change from conventional agriculture to regenerative plus the yield differences, like the monetary input it takes to sort of transition for years you're talking about like waiting for a couple of years to let things rest it's like some farmers might not be able to to handle that one two three four year transition and then also like from the distribution standpoint we'll be able to feed everybody i mean this is one of the biggest things like i haven't looked into this personally myself of like how many people can we feed is there an upper limit to regenerative agriculture as far as being able to feed the masses yeah yeah so um just just a quick clarification too um, there isn't, there's no, there's no requirement to let land sit for one, two, three, four okay. years, right? So um, with, with Rome in particular, we bought land starting from, from scratch, scratch. Um, and we're trying to get animals onto it as quickly as we could Got it. for an existing operation. You know, if we're talking about feeding where we are now and going forward, we're talking about transitioning existing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as far as a, del a, a built in delay, it's pretty, pretty minimal, Got it. um, in terms of the scale. Um, and the ability to produce yields. Let's just use Rome Ranch as another example. When you look at you know stocking rates or stocking density, what you're what you're what you're looking at is how many animals can you fit on a given acre. Um, and when you have a degraded system, the answer is not very many. It's just not producing enough nutrition, enough protein. Um, there's not enough um, food for those animals. And so at Rome Ranch, even though we're only maybe two and a half years in of having animals, our stocking rates are three times the county average. Mm. So we're taking existing land, and in this case, tripling the amount of output on the same um, you know, per acre basis as an alternative in our community because the land is healthier and it's able to sustain um, more numbers. Um, and that doesn't even include, again, the fact that they've gone from just simply leasing it to run cattle on it you know, with, with what the prior owner was, but now they're, they have eggs and they have um, broilers and they have pork and they have, you know, other revenue streams as well. So I don't think that, I think that the conversation of, is it scalable is often, um, is often, you know, misquoted and, and, and there's some liberties taken with how it's presented. I think that there is, I've, I've, I've heard some reports that say, if we can simply improve the you know stocking rates and stocking you know the ability to put animals on acres just like I was referring to on our existing rangelands where we have um, cattle we could we could sustain grass finishing um, and by virtue of being able to have them on the land build out regenerative systems for all of our existing animal based agriculture. Yeah, so animal production is something that I th is very intimately associated with regenerative. And I think just because a lot of times we have this monoculture that screws everything up, but I haven't heard a lot about plants being um, part of this equation as far as from a we're going to grow these crops and sell them and distribute them do you guys have any plans to do anything with that or is this even possible in the system you know going from a an area where we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of acres of a single thing there's just a lot of efficiencies of scale you get um what about doing this as far as our regenerative model for, for plants there's, there's absolutely a regenerative model for plants okay. now our, our expertise and experience um, largely ties back to animal production, just given where where we've come from, and and um, but there are great organizations like the Rodale Institute, and you know even even guys like Gabe Brown, um, who wrote a book called Dirt to Soil, um, who are doing both animal and plant based agriculture, and they're again, it, it's just not as complicated as we want to as we want to think of it, um, but he's doing really cool stuff, whether it be 
again, putting in his plant crops. And then as after he's harvested them, having animals come through and eat the crop res residue and then trample it down as an alternative to, you know, tilling it up to make sure you don't have, for example, tall stalks of plants sitting around that would then oxidize and then shade out any new growth. Well, once you run some, you know, beef cattle through there and then run some pigs through there, um, and they're all doing little different things, stimulating the environment in a different way. That crop residue is eaten down and trampled back down to the ground where it's closer to the sur surface of the soil. And, and then that promotes that microbiology and it gets it to where it can decay faster. And then you can go in and no-till something and your you know, water infiltration rates are better. And so, yeah, there are absolutely numerous examples. I think Joel, Joel Salatin is another one where he's doing plant and animal simultaneously. So there's, there's plenty of information out there globally um, of organizations that have uh, farms and, and organizations that have figured out how to do this in every imaginable environment and context. You know, the guys that we learned a lot of our understanding of the animal side of it from are an organization called the Savory Institute. They have tons of content and, and they started doing this in, in, in Africa, in the plains in Africa, where, I mean, you have some really brittle, really challenged, you think about animals and basically, you know, desert type environments, you know, if we can do it there, we can certainly do it um, in the majority of our, our farming systems. Got it. And then, like you said before, like if people want to support what you guys are doing and like be part of this system, they can obviously vote with their dollars and support you guys and uh, pick up some of your products. But other than that, like what, how can people participate? Like what can people do as a, as a consumer, as a, as, a, as a part of this whole movement? Yeah, I mean, look, I'll say it one, one, one more time. There is no food revolution without the consumer. Um, and so the only person that can change our agriculture system is consumers individually signaling that they're tired of being misled and they're going to support a better way. And for us, um, you know, for me, my, 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 my call to action for the folks listening would be um, to do one of two things, right? Get pissed off and um, decide that you're going to take a stand and you're tired of, um, you know, being complicit in the system that is completely counter to what you truly believe in and go out and educate yourself and get books and, and, and do research on, um, you know, different farms and ranches around your area that are doing things in a regenerative way. Um, that's a big ask. That's a lot of information to learn in a, in a short period of time. Um, one thing that, that we're trying to do to make it easier on consumers is to say, visit forceofnaturemeets.com, check out our blogs. Um, we're going to have guest contributions. We're going to be connecting people to all different sorts of um, research, and our and our our content center will grow over time. Um, but you know, figure out those issues that are most important to you, and begin to learn and educate yourself. And we're going to do everything we can to make that interesting for you, um, and easier to access for you. And if you believe in what we're doing, and 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 you want to make a difference, then you know, support our brand or support uh, any of the ranches um, and farmers that we promote, um, and begin to help us create awareness to the fact that there are people out there that are willing to pay a small premium to have healthier food, to have more nourishing food, tastier food, and food that um, is part of a solutions-based system um, that aligns with their values. Yeah, and like this certainly isn't a paid spot at all, but I mean, I, I've been very vocal about how amazing not only the taste, but the nutrition is with you guys' stuff. And I, I mean, one, the taste is incredible. Um, two, the the ancestral blend is something that I'm a huge, huge fan of, which is you guys take bison and beef and then ground in liver and heart. So that way, like you, you can sneak this into everybody's nutrition. You can, you can trick the family into eating organ meats, organ meats, which is like one of my favorite things possible. Uh, so yeah, man, I'm just a huge fan of you guys' work. Really appreciate the time. Um, anywhere else you want to point folks to? Um, yeah, I mean, if there's, if there's like any, you know, there's, there's a great book on animal agriculture called defending beef. Mm -hmm. Um, we also, we sell that along with Gabe Brown's book, um, on our website. Those are two great first sources to go out and learn about opportunities and realities in animal agriculture and then ways that we can change our food system. Um, and then definitely check out our website. And if you have any further questions, we have a, you know, info at forceofnaturemeats.com email. We would love nothing more than to inundate and overwhelm you with information to empower you um, to be a more conscious consumer yourself and to share with your friends and families and to you know evangelize this food movement and, and help us you know essentially um, improve agriculture and, 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 and save our role in this planet and, and be better um, be better to um, the, the ecosystems that we've um, We've compromised unintentionally. Yeah. 
Well, appreciate you, man, and all the work you're doing to sort of fight the good fight for real food. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, Anthony, it's been fun being here. Um, appreciate everything you guys are doing as well. Thanks, man. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Natural State Podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, I'd really appreciate you heading over to whatever service you're listening to this podcast on, dropping me a five-star review and your thoughts on the show. This helps us get discovered by more people and spreading the good gospel of health. And if you want to stay plugged into all of my self-health experiments, recent research in books that I'm reading and my interpretations of those things, products that I'm testing and thoughts on all things related to health, check out my free weekly newsletter called The Feed. You can sign up for that at dranthonygustin.com slash The Feed. That's dranthonygustin.com slash The Feed. Thanks again for tuning in and your support of the Natural State Podcast.